welcome. All right, now now I'm putting my my show voice on. Welcome, glad to see everybody here. Um, this is Back to the Basics, and um, I have the great uh, pleasure of being able to talk with Yelena Kelleher, or is it Yelena Ristich? Um, it's hard to know just now. Um, all of the above. All of the above, all right, or just Yelena. I'm just gonna call her Yelena from, the, from this point forward, um, and you can just correct me as we go. So, so who is Yelena? You're probably wondering, so I'm gonna tell you. Um, so Yelena is currently associate professor and chair of the undergraduate experience program at Golden Gate University. Um, Yelena's experience as an administrator in student services and as an academic administrator at Golden Gate, and not to mention an alumna of uh, Golden Gate University, made her um, the ideal person to be responsible for the undergraduate gateway and associate capstone courses. We're gonna talk about the kind of the unique needs of adult uh, students, working people, and, and um, and um, you know how we work with them at uh, Golden Gate University, and how Yellen has been really the person who has spearheaded a lot of our efforts in this way. Um, let's see. So, so Yellen's research and curricular interests include the intentional design of meta learning opportunities. Yellen, I'm writing that down because I'm going to make you explain what a meta learning opportunity is at the appropriate moment. Okay. Um, and also the integration of curriculum and student services. And um, you're, a, a, as you well know, you're a graduate of Golden Gate University Law School. Um, you're currently pursuing an LLM degree, correct? correct? All right, and, um, and you um, are a member of the California Bar, as I understand it. That is correct. Okay, all right, I didn't wanna make up any stuff or, you know. <laughs> right, this is great, so welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, so we have a lot to talk about, and 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 what the, our our topic, broadly speaking, as I mentioned, is is um, what's unique about adult learners, and and um, and what's what's a great uh, what's the best way to um, work with adults who are looking for um, you know educational opportunities, pursuing a degree, that sort of thing. There, there are differences, right? Or else our conversation's over like in thirty seconds, I think. It would be a very short webinar. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we do believe there are differences. Yes, absolutely. Oh, good. good. And, and, and um, I understand that there are, at the last time I checked, 36 million Americans, this is people in the United States, who have some college and no degree. So really the vast majority of that 36 million um, fall into this category that we're going to, of people we're going to be talking about right now. Correct. Yeah. We often call them the returner, the adult returner or the returning student. So rather than it being an age category, we think about it as a start to a higher education pursuit and then a stop. And so when they come back to pick that endeavor up again, they're the returning, most oftentimes adult learner. Um, but I think those terms can be used interchangeably and I probably will, I'll be honest. Um, oh, fine. Yeah. That's right. No, and I, I think we've read, and you and I were talking about this at one point, it's not so much your age that just makes you uh, fall into this category. Um, some of it's that you um, uh, are financially independent or that you yourselves have dependents that you're raising, right? There are a number of other things that uh, put people into this category, would you say? Absolutely. Having some life experience, um, having a military career, uh, perhaps right out of high school, and then either leaving the military or coinciding with being, uh, being still in service, picking up some, some of, um, whether it's coursework or training or, or you know, what have you. What's interesting about that as well is the, the notion of learning happens everywhere is actually quite, quite critical even when we're defining the group that we're talking about. Because as much as I would say, or some say that, uh, a returning learner, a returning student is somebody who has been in school in an academic setting. That may not be the case, but if learning truly happens everywhere, even in a military career, there absolutely there are training, training happening there. Any other career or job that they may have uh, been in or, or pursuing, there is learning there. And so I would still consider those folks that have never, never taken a college course to, to be a returner. Oh, okay, great, great. So, so a returner is really the person. So it's, it's somebody, it, just, to, just to put a fine point on it, what if you never went to school before? You, you know, you just decided you weren't college material right off the, you know, off the bat and decided, I don't know, 20 years later, 
a different sure. sort of circumstance or am I just like the splitting the hairs too, too finely here? Well, it could be, it could be. Um, one of the, the things that I think makes unique or adult students or adult learners or turners unique, uh, which is one of the questions that you asked earlier, is this sense of having been to college and having had an experience, maybe very positive, maybe negative. Everybody's situation is different. And for whatever reason, the learner decided they were going to exit college or um, maybe take a fantastic job and they were pulled out of the, um, their education and then pursued, pursued their career at that point. Um, what's unique is that they're drawing on that experience when they return. And, and so to tie those two questions together, I would say that whether or not you've had any college courses at all, I would say still makes you a return because learning happens everywhere. So you were learning on the job, training, and things. Um, and so now you're returning to, to, a, um, to an education. I see. To I a see. learning experience. Okay. So, so that, that's really where, uh, where I wanted to draw the distinction. But looking at it from the perspective of the uniqueness is that all of our students that are not the traditional student, meaning graduating from high school and entering college and doing the four or five, whatever number of years, but, but doing that track is really what we consider the traditional model to be. And so this is any version, not that. <laughs> okay, all right, so, so I was just being too literal is what you're trying to say in a really nice way, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are all interesting questions. You know, I think we could probably dive for an hour just, just on this topic about, about this definition. But I think as you're serving the adult learner, um, it's to keep in mind that there are so many different kinds of experiences that each student comes with. And I think in many situations, you know, in pretty much all life situations, you never want to assume that people are not bringing in a certain set of experiences or knowledge or wisdom about whatever it is that, uh, that you're imparting. You know, certainly as a professor, you, I have learned not to walk into a room and assume that my students don't know, uh, you know, what it is that I'm going to talk about. And so you, you tie that in. Mm. And I think that that is, that is a very positive, unique aspect of the adult learner. And having the student recognize that and appreciate that about themselves, as opposed to thinking that because they're quote unquote non-traditional, they're going about it in a backwards way or they missed an opportunity or it's, it, it wasn't meant for them or, or somehow they're, they're uh, challenged by it, but rather the perspective, I would hope, uh, certainly as our students go through our program, but other, other programs that they learn that that's actually a positive attribute, that they have all of these other experiences uh, coming to the table as they start their traditional, more traditional college class experience. Right, right, right. Okay, I see. So, well, that, that, that brings a lot of questions to mind. Let me see if I can put them in an order that will actually make sense when I say them out loud. But um, so, all right, so the first thing that comes to mind is something that I, I think I've, I've heard come up when I've been involved with conversations like this, which is, of course, no one is really a blank slate, right? Everyone brings their experiences into the classroom, even if they are the 18-year-old traditional student, right? So, um, but, but these folks, if I'm understanding it right, um, are just that much more differentiated because they've got this wide range of experiences. Um, they tend to, well, just, just being out in the world, just to being able to see how these ideas play out in real time and, and, and that sort of thing. So, so if that's the case, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, how, how different should a school that focuses on returners, as we're calling them today. Um, how, how different should that school be from, from one that focuses on traditional students? Like, like, is it just the classrooms that should be different? Is it just the instruction? Like, like is that too much? Can we just talk about this for the next 40 minutes and then be done? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot there and a lot that we can unpack. Um, how should a school be different serving this, this population? It's critical that the institution and really the whole organization within the institution makes student-centered decisions. And that's not to say that traditional institutions don't, but I think there's a heightened necessity for it when you're serving this population. 
And actually, I can jump to one of my slides here that could explain this difference. You've got a slide. I have a slide. I have two, actually. That's, oh my God. Um, so, by, by the while you're doing that, by the way, let me just let me just mention something that um, a couple of folks have posted really good questions in the chat. If you don't mind um, posting them in the Q and A area, that way. Yelena and I, and uh, and our excellent producer Joyce, by the way, who you can't see, but she's here, um, can can sort of make sure that those get addressed um, in a timely manner. All right, I'll, I'll try to check on the chat as well. But I'm sorry to to derail you there, Yelena. Just uh, should have no, mentioned that. No problem. So the slide. Yeah. Is that coming through? Yes. Okay, great. Talking about the differentiation, if we look on the one side, non-traditional student experience, you'll notice you have your student there in the middle and they're sort of in this confused posture. And the academics are really what it is that they're trying to do, which, which is the classroom, taking the classes, getting the degree. And all of the services, tutoring, advising, veteran, wellness, you know, all of those different things are sort of available and around. Um, but there's not this necessarily cohesive or, 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 you know, easy, easy access to those things. And the academics are really in the middle. And then you'll notice that they're on, you know, on the top of the student's head there, there's family, there's bills, there's a job, there's, you know, their potential military experience. So these are the things that are actually happening uh, ancillary, right? They're not, it's, it's not part of the experience. They need to set that aside and really focus on the classroom and the curriculum, what's going on, and figure out these other services as they go. And so when we look at an adult learner focused uh, model, it's putting the whole student where they are with all of the considerations that they have going on in the center of the learning, and then all of these other services that are actually quite essential and should be integrated into their experience as opposed to these other things that they could go seek out as needed but rather that they're always there for them and sort of circling around them and one of one of the things that uh, we've tried really hard to do at least in the undergraduate courses that that i uh, help contribute to is find opportunities for these services to actually be part of the curriculum and we do that in a few different ways. One of the things that is critical for uh, our learners is that what they're, what they're learning and what's happening in the classroom is relevant. So tr really trying to avoid the busy work and the um, uh, you know, things that aren't actually going to be helpful or beneficial to them at work the next day or you know, as, soon as, as soon as they, or even at home for that matter. And so really creating relevant curriculum, but then not just excluding the fact that what is very relevant for them and their learning is that they will need advising on a regular basis, that they might need wellness services. Uh, and when they need it, that it's right there and available to them and they know exactly how to get it. Instead of a problem arising and becoming so overblown where their academics might suffer, wellness is there you know, to get, to get in uh, as, as, as well as tutoring. So these two different models, you had asked the question or made a note earlier about what meta-learning opportunities are. And we, we define that as, as putting the student at the center of their own learning and having them appreciate the fact that their family, although they might not have as much time with them necessarily, is, has to be part of that experience for them as a support system, but also how do they tie in thinking about their family or their job or their, mm -hmm. um, you know, other, other issues that are perhaps keeping them from being focused on their academics. How can they integrate those things into their academics? Okay, no, so that's great. If I can, if I can cut in there, this, this gets to something that, uh, that I was thinking about earlier as, as I was preparing a bit, which is, so what you're really suggesting is not only are the lines blurred between the different aspects of education, right, but but also, it, it seems like you're blurring the line between the so-called ivory tower on the one hand and like the real world on the other hand, right? So there's much more integration as, as I'm understanding it. Is, is that fair to say or am I uh, overstating it? No, that, that is very fair to say. And all of the folks that are turning that gear wheel around the student 
are working in this concerted effort to make sure whatever whatever role they have at the institution that, that they are circling around the student as opposed to the student being forced to circle around the organization to find what it is that they need. You know, institutions are just so notorious for um, putting their catalog as, you know, up on the web and that's the website. And especially now in, in a uh, very online, especially now, environment, you know, the website is the campus. And so rather than needing to know what you're searching for in the search term, what becomes available to the student uh, where they don't have to search the, our terminology, but rather we're putting that service or that uh, what, whatever they need in front of them, as opposed to them having to seek it out and search for it. So you're meeting them where they are. Exactly. Okay. exactly. okay, really good. There's already a question here about this. Somebody mentions a, um, the idea of mentoring as a, as a kind of education, um, you know, in which you have people create personal connections with instructors and alumni and, and folks like that. That would be an example, I guess, of the kind of um, thing you're talking about here. Absolutely. And I will update this slide to make sure that that's there as well as, you know, other. Oh, other services that uh, <laughs> that should be there. In all fairness, I did do this slide a couple of years ago for a uh, for a conference, uh, and so I, I pulled it from that. But yeah, yeah. And some of these things are more automated than they look like they are in this slide too. I would guess, right? Like we don't have to push those things with as much effort as we did back then when you did the slide, right? <laughs> That's true. Good point. <laughs> You know, we've had a lot of jokes about these little uh, animations and characters and how they look. And, and uh, one of the feedback um, items that I received from, from some of our um, folks and services was, boy, they really look like they're slogging and they're not happy about doing it. And we're actually very happy, so can you make them more excited? And if I had the animation skills to do it, I would, but I just do not. Yeah, so. be, well, they don't have faces, so it's really hard to yeah. know how they're feeling it's, about it's it. Hard to give them an expression, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, well we, we, well, we could talk about that endlessly too, but let me get back to the actual topic at hand. Um, <laughs> um, so so the, the rest of the question that I was just looking at is, um, um, do, do people who work in a system like this need any kind of special training or preparation? Are there other considerations that people have to take into account in, in doing this? In other words, can you just do this or is there something more involved? Like what, what does it take to, uh, to operate a system like this successfully? Well, if, if you're looking to be adult learner focused, then the greatest education that, that one could delve into is listening to the student body and making sure that you are regularly canvassing, getting feedback, uh, whether it's through satisfaction surveys or within assignments. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to ask my students to reflect on their learning. Uh, so for example, in, in one of the capstones, you had created an assignment uh, toward the end of their degree. It's the end of their degree. It's a culminating experience. And so one of the assignments was for them to review the programmatic learning outcomes that we had designed saying, this is what a graduate of the program should be able to do, right? That's how we draft our learning outcomes. And we asked the students, how do we do? How, how do you think we did in terms of achieving this success for you, of course? Where's the gap? What is it that you might do to, to fill in that gap? How would you change these learning outcomes uh, to more accurately reflect what it is that you received and now know in terms of skills, knowledge, ability, um, expertise? And it's quite fascinating to see their responses. Uh, I would say it's an unsolicited, uh, you know, <laughs> review. Um, and of course, the student, these students are at the end of their program, so they're very happy anyway. Um, but the comments are, are wonderful in that they say, you know, I really, yeah, I really do feel like I know these things. But that reflection is another meta-learning opportunity where you, we didn't do the degree to you. We didn't force the degree on you or all of this learning. But rather, what has, how have you learned, you know, in the process and what have you gained from it? So having them go through those exercises, which I think, of course, we, we, we do that, but calling it out and really making it an obvious, this is what I want you to tell me, uh, when you're drafting assignments, I think goes a very long way. 
um, you know, speaking of the capstone, when we talk about one of the learning outcomes of a program being critical thinking, you know, the, the, the worst thing I think I could hear a student say is when I say, so tell me what critical thinking means to you in terms of academic curriculum. And they say, oh, well, that's CRTH 10, right? You know, and that it's the siloed class number uh, as opposed to a concept in a way of problem solving, a way of thinking, and a way of being uh, in life as a lifelong learner. I see. I see. So wait, just so, so that people know, CRTH 10 would be a course number at GGU. <laughs> yes. Okay, good, good, good. And, and you're saying, right, so it, you shouldn't just relegate critical thinking to that single course. It's something that should really show up everywhere and, and some, something that should be something that they can use throughout the rest of their, their careers and in their lives too. All right, great. So, so let me ask you this. I should have asked you this at the beginning because it's a real softball, easy question. But, but you've been talking about adult learners and such. How, how did you get interested in all of this? How did you come to be doing this kind of work? Well, I've been with Golden Gate for 20 years. Uh, and I actually am an alum twice over. I also received my bachelor's degree. Uh, so bachelor's degree and then law degree. And, and at that time, you know, going back 20 years, G, uh, GGU was um, not exactly how it looks today, but I think at the core of our mission and our roots really was serving this non-traditional learner, somebody who's looking to further their career, gain knowledge, expertise, uh, credential in an area to, to really change their lives. And so that, that's deeply rooted in the, in the Golden Gate mission you know, for over 100 years. And so when I started, I started, um, I've had a lot of jobs in 20 years. <laughs> um, but my first you know, full-time job at, at Golden Gate was working in the admissions office. And then that turned into student affairs. Uh, I was an advisor, I, I directed the advising center. And so from, from that moment, it really became clear that we have a very strong mission to, to support folks that are not doing this in a very traditional way. And so we should invent the, the way to do this to serve that population. So having that focus has, has been uh, very helpful, certainly to me as I've gone through my career and done, and, and done so many you know, different aspects of administration and then moving over to a faculty role. It go, goes back to something that we talked about earlier, which is really putting the student at the center. So before you make policy decisions or before you make you know, even curriculum decisions, thinking about the student and putting them in that central point about how it will impact them and what that means. And not just them as you know, one of the students in the seats in the class, but rather how would this impact how they can relate to their family and how they can relate to their job and what that means. And, and so that I was, really excited about this, I suppose, non-traditional approach to what institutions have been doing for a really long time and driving that mission of GGU forward mm -hmm. and putting in systems and processes that really identified, uh, we don't have to do it the way that everybody else does it. It may be best practice, but is it best practice for us? And that was a, a great challenge and, and really exciting, um, or I should say is it best practice for, for an adult learner focused institution. Right, right. Um, so it's interesting because what you're saying is that wait, there's a meta thing here. I'm not sure where it is, but like you yourself had this experience and that's really part of what helped you to think about what these things should look like. So it's, it's it, you, you yourself are a literal example of putting into practice the things you've experienced, right? And relating that to your learning. It, it, am I, it, it, does that make sense? No, that's true. I, I was a part-time evening student uh, when I was getting my JD. And so working full-time and then going to school pretty much every night for four years, um, that definitely enhanced my perspective, certainly, and put me in the shoes of, what it's like to manage and juggle all of these competing interests in your world while trying to obtain a degree. Uh, it, is, it, is not, it is not easy, but it can be, um, I suppose, enhanced by these experiences. And if you don't try to compartmentalize them, if you embrace them all, 
you know, some to, to the image there uh, that we have up on the screen. You know, embrace that, don't fight it. Fighting the process, fighting your reality, uh, we seldom win <laughs> in, in, that, in that situation. And so accepting that, um, that you do have these competing interests. And so now how do you, how do you create them, you know, as one? Um, you know, one of the ways that we do that, and actually I'll uh, pull up my next slide. Oh, wait, right. we've got two slides. Okay, great. Slide number two. Um, and we're getting tons of questions, by the way, so. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'm happy to pause if you. No, no, no. Let's see what you got here. This okay. This might answer all the questions. Yeah. Uh, so one of the, um, major responsibilities that I have is uh, furthering our gateway course, which is UGP 10. And this is the very first course that students take. Um, it's required. And it is, I would say, you know, a huge value proposition of, of Golden Gate undergraduate studies. Um, and this is the course description. And very similar to other institutions, traditional, non traditional, you know, there, there's this first year experience course or gateway course that many institutions will offer. And it's an orientation to being a student. So things like study skills, uh, time management, uh, you know, just knowing what, what uh, services are available, things like that. So this is not a unique course, but how we tailored it to the adult learner is, is quite unique. And I say this is the course description because it really focuses in the course, taking a student through their educational goals, their personal goals, and their professional goals, and making sure that there is alignment there to find that sweet spot, you know, the nexus. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense for my personal value system and what is really important to me in life? What I'm trying to do professionally, how I'm trying to grow either transition to a whole new career or grow within my career? And then is this the right education for me to get there? And so the whole course is focused on this, finding that sweet spot in the nexus. And it's a great, um, it's a great course to teach because we really get to, to know our students and what, what their goals are. are um, at the same time, it's still an orientation. So they're learning about Golden Gate. They're learning about um, how to find the services that I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. and when to know they need them, uh, when to seek them out. Um, but in addition to that, when we talk about study skills or when we talk about time management, we're not focused on time management as a student, we're focused on time management as a person. And the principles of this course are based on executive level coaching uh, principles. And so we're looking at you know, Stephen Covey principles and looking at different time management techniques that are not about just being a student. It's about managing everything in your life. Okay, good. So really then in this case, I really like this idea. It's education is not just the separate compartment, right? In your life, if you're an adult or a returner, um, adult student, working person, um, it's really something that needs to integrate with all of, um, with everything else that's going on. And, and it's really informed by everything else that's going on. And then ideally, I think I'm putting all the puzzle pieces together, what you learn in the classrooms informs what's going on outside of the classroom, right? In the, in, in the rest of your, your world, if you will. Um, which, which makes it really, what I really like about what you're describing is that it really explains to people, helps people understand the importance of being a lifelong learner, that everything is an opportunity for learning. I'm, I think I'm summarizing everything you just said, so. Um, um, you're doing but, great. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. I try to pay attention once in a while. Um, but um, um, you, you're you're um, you're saying that it's not only what happens in the classroom. It, it's not bound by what's happening right now. It's also something going forward. This idea of lifelong learning that you you mentioned just briefly um, means this is something just like with your critical thinking that you described that you'll need to continue on with throughout your whole life. Really, that's right. One of the assignments. I'll give you an example is putting together uh, and going through an informational interview. Again, that's not a new concept. That's uh, you know, quite common. It's an assignment in the class. It's scaffolded throughout, which means that we begin that assignment in week one, and then ultimately it's due in week eight, and there's pieces of it. So we, it's called scaffolding. We scaffold those assignments throughout. And 
oftentimes, you know, students will have some anxiety about, well, I don't know exactly who the perfect person is for me right now. I have so many unanswered questions. And the response that we give them is, this is not about perfection. This is about progress. And so what you want to do is go through the whole process, go through all the steps. And when you come out the other end, you will have learned a tremendous amount about the process, uh, in addition to having the informational interview and learning from this individual person, but that it is a repeatable um, process that you can do over and over again. Um, if you ever have a, an inkling or a desire in the future to pick up a hobby, or some of my students are about to retire and they're getting the degree for their own personal edification and they would just want to beat their kids or their grandkids right. uh, you know, across the stage at commencement. Uh, and so in that situation, they're not necessarily looking to transition careers or change jobs. They're done and they're very much looking forward to the next chapter of retirement. But the, the process of an informational interview or of doing the, the kind of work that we do in, in our gateway course is this repeatable notion of, okay, well, what, as soon as you're about to retire or, you know, whenever that day comes, you should probably start interviewing retirees that seem really happy. So what are those steps that you would go about researching and finding that person and what kinds of questions and how do you set that up and then what do you do with the information you're done? So that, that's the best example that I can provide. You know, there's always something next for us, or at least, you know, there mm -hmm. should be. And how do you embark on making those kinds of informed decisions about making sure that you're in this sweet spot, right? This nexus of um, everything aligned and working in concert uh, and, and moving forward. Oh, that's great. That's great. All right. So I, I want to get to some of these questions here sure. because they're really good. And um, um, I'm going to see if I can find one that's really tricky that you can't answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Try me. Uh, <laughs> Let me see. All right. Well, I, obviously, one of the things that we've talked about in, um, every time with every guest on this show has been the effects of uh, the COVID-19 and the pandemic and such, um, and how it's affected what they're doing, um, how it's affected the people they serve. Um, so how about that question? I mean, how has that affected what you're doing, whether it's in the classroom or elsewhere? And um, how, does it pose particular challenges for um, the returners? you know, mm -hmm. these, these folks yeah. we've been talking about. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges, I've mentioned this several times, is are, are these competing interests that our students have. We've got a lot going on um, at home, at work, um, whether it's taking care of parents or taking care of children or, you know, somebody once told me, you know, big people, big problems, right? Little people, little problems. And so um, as we age, we take on a lot more uh, responsibility. Um, and so the stakes become higher, you know, if you will. And I, I don't, that is always true uh, for the adult learner. And I think it's heightened in the situation that we currently find ourselves and, and what's happening in the world around us. It's one thing to manage your children um, and get their lunch packed and get them off to school and make sure there's somebody there to pick them up. It's another thing to be homeschooling them while you're trying to manage your career and, and you know, whether it's confines of, of physical space where you're all trying to do that together um, or taking that burden on as well. Um, and and that, is, that is a real challenge. So I would say the, the current pandemic of COVID is um, that the same kinds of challenges that the adult learner faces are just even more heightened. Um, and, and whether it's, you know, figuring out my sweet spot that was you know, three months ago now is, is a little bit different today. <laughs> the goals are smaller at this moment. Um, you know, but the, the constant ability to, to reflect and to think about, okay, what, it is, what is it that I'm trying to achieve and keeping an eye on the prize is, is difficult in the best of times. Um, mm. And then I would say, you know, with, with, the, with the current state of um, certainly this country, but, you know, even just globally, it's the stress of, of unknowing how can you help, what can you do, how can you talk to your children uh, about these things. And, and so adding another layer of education to how can, I, 
how can I be a positive force or how can I um, influence and change, you know, whether it's, whether it's protesting or it's talking to, to family that maybe don't see eye to eye with you, right? It's, it's another layer of a, a stressor factor, but then also a kind of education um, that is, you know, we could, we could draw those pictures <laughs> on the last slide, right, of these other competing factors. Um, the advice I suppose that I would have is it may seem very, you know, silly to say, but time management again, where, which is a big part, mentioned it, of, of our uh, UGP 10 Gateway course, but actually blocking out time, whether it's to be on social media and feel like we're part of it or um, doing some volunteer work or, or, you know, whatever that is, but, but actually building in time, building in time to talk to children, building in time to talk to family about what's happening, as opposed to shoving it away because you're focused and I have to study right now and I'm not even gonna think about those things, but rather this incorporation of all of, all of what you have going on in your life and time blocking that, setting aside, I have this time and I'm gonna spend this time, uh, like I said, on social media or watching CNN or you know, whatever it is that, that, that we may feel like we need to do. Right, 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 okay, good. It, it seems like you also, with time management in mind, both from the perspective of the instructor and the, and the student, need to think about flexibility really differently. You have to be prepared to bring these things into the classroom, and not just in the gateway course, I would imagine, but in, in any course, right? Um, because you, everything is a teachable moment in some way. Everything is something to manage. Um, um, are you able to do that um, now? Or is that a challenge on, on the instructor side as well? Uh, yeah, we absolutely are able to do that. Um, I would encourage instructors to, to do that where appropriate and where they can and, and incorporate that. I and mean, we do try to do that. And that goes back to the relevance uh, factor. But if, if we consider the image that I had, again, <laughs> keep referring to it, but around accepting the student where they are. And then we think about it a little bit more broadly and we say accepting the people where they are we cannot eliminate the current state of the world. We can't just remove that and say, nope, now we're gonna talk about this particular chapter and textbook. I mean, it's just part of what is going on around us. So, you know, the advice that I would have for instructors is to acknowledge, incorporate where appropriate, give some time and space for that discussion, and then Re, you know, re, bring it back in or bring it back around where, okay, and we're time blocking right now that we're gonna learn about X or we, we are going to learn about this. Um, and, and just, I suppose, pay respects to the fact that we are all having you know, these mm -hmm. kinds of um, thoughts that we may try to dismiss them and that will you know, maybe work for a little bit of time, but it really start to de starts to detract from focus. And if instructors, can find a way to embrace, let's give it a minute, let's give it a couple minutes of class tonight. Or you tell me how it would be helpful for you. Is this respite from that? Is it an escape for you? Or would we like to address it? So again, listening to the students about what it is that they're thinking and what's making it particularly hard for them right now. Uh, and then incorporating, incorporating that into an opportunity to talk about and maybe learn from one and that's another wonderful thing about this um, population of, of learners. They bring so much experience and knowledge to the classroom mm -hmm. that taking advantage of that as, as often as we can is, is, a, is a big bonus for us. So there's peer-to-peer -peer learning going on too. Absolutely. Yeah, good, yeah. good. Um, all right, so here's a really tough question. I, okay. I don't know the answer to it, so I probably shouldn't read it, but you know, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so, um, so with all of this um, meeting people where they are going on, right? Um, how how do you how do you manage the requirements of of adult learners, such as like uh, deadlines and work quality, when people are having difficulties during a course? So, you know, especially now, you know, um, where people are losing jobs, having family stresses. Um, can you personalize this for for everybody? I mean, I mean, do you make group exceptions, individual exceptions? What's um, 
it, it seems like a lot to balance. It, you know, so in other words, how can you personalize it if on the other hand, there's supposed to be a set of standards that's common to everybody? Sure, sure. That is a really great question. Um, yeah. And I probably have several answers for it. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, well, the easy answer would be nationally, globally, industry-wide, I think that there will be, uh, you know, just a, a, an entry of COVID on transcripts. Mm. Where if we're not, if some institutions are not requiring the SAT, if it's not being administrated, you know, just as an example, um, that that's a big question right now. And um, if, if we're looking at the impact of COVID making that kind of massive change, um, I really believe that this is a, a unique time and will be looked back hopefully sooner than later as a very unique time where people uh, did relax and, and loosen those restrictions um, be, because of, of what that meant. Now there's, you know, some might say to that, well, but then, then that's unfair or, you know, others who had to go through the experience, you know, those learning outcomes had to be met. Now we're just waiving exams or, you know, doing things like this. I, I think that's all true. Um, and I think that if we consider the uh, stressor factor, uh, in addition to the kind of education that we're getting, which may not be specific to the particular course or outcomes in, in, that, in that regard, but how much folks are learning about what's going on in the world. You know, I know a lot more about viruses and how they transmit. Um, and so when we talk about learning happens everywhere, you know, that's an example of, I've just learned a tremendous amount about something that frankly, I wish I didn't need to know, but <laughs> we all, we all have become educated in that regard. So if you take a holistic approach to the experience that we're in uh, and, and appreciate again, the fact that, we are learning things that may not be exactly tied to the learning outcomes in a particular course or particular test even, but embrace that as part of the holistic experience of the student at the time and collectively look at that and say, there was learning happening. It might not have been precisely what I needed them to learn in this regard, but there was learning happening. And then of course, you know, the standards have to be, especially for some of our STEM, in order for the student to progress, there, there do have to be existing standards. And so that's when services support, um, offering other options, you know, more of an administrative perspective to get the student in time. If they're not going to make it, if they're not going to be able to pass, you know, the exam as it is, then maybe we start looking at alternatives and dropping the class or picking something else up. Things like that. I don't know if that answered the question. That was a it's, a big, it's a big question it's with multi, uh, multiple answers to it. I think it would be challenging. I, I, I think some of what you're speaking to is just the question of like, wh what's the role of an institution in this kind of a situation? Um, what can, can we as an institution or, you know, what, what can GGU, your institution, learn as, as we go, uh, um, you know, that we, can, that we can incorporate into how we um, work with our students as well? Um, there's just a lot going on. I, I'm, I'm thinking also of, um, um, well, here's, here's a, a question from one of our um, attendees. Uh, is institutional racism a bigger issue for the returner and in, in, in the classroom that you're describing? How would instructors address it? This is really one of those learning opportunities, even for people who thought they kind of knew what they were doing already. Um, I, I, I dropped this in within, with three minutes to go in, the, in, the, in this show. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, but but I mean it's 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 an example. It's the most it's the most um, in your face example right now of of things that we ought to be doing, um, you know, as an institution to to address what's going on, not just with our students, but within our communities as well. I would think. Um, Absolutely. This, um, I, I I would say it perhaps is different. For the adult learner um, in in the sheer number of experiences perhaps for some uh, having having seen and heard and lived and uh, but I think there's also this this necessity to understand that each people each people each person has their own um, 
a set of experiences that they bring. Um, and I think the best thing that we can do as educators and as, as creating community, right? Because it's not just about delivering education um, to the learning outcomes, but rather building and creating a community of learners, lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. And so giving space and respect for what is in the current climate and what's happening, I, I, I think there absolutely should be time, whatever the subject matter, for that to be part of the dialogue, respectful dialogue, um, informed dialogue, and positive in terms of what can we do? We know change needs to happen. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. How can you contribute to that? Um, and, and just having, having a very respectful, um, commu open communication that education sir, has served that role for ever. And, and we should further that. You mean as a catalyst for change or as, as something that itself should be changing to reflect what's going on in the world? Well, probably both. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we are educating thought leaders and the faculty are thought leaders you know, themselves, there, there absolutely should be within education, that's the environment where we should be talking about what does that change look like and how can we contribute to that change? Mm -hmm. What needs to change? How could it, how should it, right? I mean, these are, these are the kinds of questions and, and dialogue that should be happening within, within all higher education yeah. venues. So I, um, we're about out of time, as I was saying. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I know I'm, I'm asking you harder questions than I've asked at, uh, in, the, in other sessions, but I really kind of want to know the answers. So um, that's, that's why, um, but it, it's, it, this is not, there, there's no way we're going to resolve all this right now. Um, but there is one question I think is really relevant as, as we you know, wrap up, um, which is um, what advice, oh, thank you. Um, is, what advice would you have for working adults who are considering continuing their education right now? I, I guess what I'm asking is, is now a good time to go back to school? I mean, is this considering everything that's going on? What, what would you, what advice would you give if somebody asked you that? Sure. I think uh, any time is a good time if it's the right time for the student. Um, and the, the advice that I would give really is about imagining what the experience of school looks like. What does it feel like? What is, what is that? How, how can, as a, as a student, as a prospective student, what do I want school to feel like? And what do I want to be getting out of it? And once that visioning of, you know, what, what is this endeavor going to be like um, is, is solidified, then go find the right institution that is going to meet that vision. And the reason I say that is often our, our um, adult returning students have an experience that, that they had perhaps in a, in a traditional format or whatever their previous education was like, and they bring that vision or that image of what it's like, thinking that's what it's going to be like in the future. And um, letting go of that, I think, is also important because there are so many alternative methods and ways um, you know, different kinds of institutions and different things. You know, Golden Gate's a good example. Um, we don't have a grassy knoll on a football team. Um, you know, that's not, that's not what we're about. And so if, for example, if a, a value of a learner is, I really want to be able to go to the football games, um, then, you know, Golden Gate's not the right institution for you. And that's okay. But for the student who is thinking about, I really need a situation where I can work you know, at home, online, have the flexibility, maybe take some in person, you know, maybe do, do these things shortened eight week um, format, you know, or shorter than that, different, uh, uh, what we call PLA, um, or, uh, you know, prior learning experience or credit for that, you know, different, different ways to get to goal. Then uh, vision that right? Envision that and then look for that experience that most closely matches to what it is that you're trying to get and let go of all of the pre, pre you know, thoughts that you had about what it was going to be like or what it was before. 
Right. Well, that's all right. So it's more than just a yes, no question. And clearly, isn't it? <laughs> did, did I go over my time? No, 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 no. It's fine. I, I turned off the timer. Um, no, no. But, but I do want to thank you. I, I, I really want to be respectful of your time, but I really appreciate your coming on to talk about what you do. Um, Yellen Aristich Kelleher. That's I'm going to say all three of them. How about that? All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Associate Professor in the School of Undergraduate Studies and, and Chair of the Undergraduate Experience um, Program at GGU. Um, thanks very much. And, and for, for those of you who want to share this with your friends, we'll be posting this on our YouTube page um, shortly, I would hope. Um, we got, I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions. They were all really good. In fact, you got one from a, a student of yours, I think, Elena, who was just telling you how great the class was. Um, so, but, but thanks very much. And uh, Oh, and we're going to have another episode on the 18th, uh, Thursday after next at uh, 11 a.m. Um, and that's going to be with um, folks who are going to talk to us about the cannabis industry, which is um, apparently more important than ever in the Bay Area. Um, so we'll find out why that is. All right. Thanks very much, Elena. Thank you for having me, Mark. This was a lot of fun.